full board meeting. My name is Mary Sharp, and I'll be serving as your chairperson today. We will begin this morning's meeting with the roll call. Mr. Whitehead, would you proceed, please? Mr. Fleming? Here. Mr. Brown? Sorry. Mr. Gill? Here. <laughs> Vice Chair Lyles Wallace? Here. Um, Ms. I don't see Mr. Norcross. Ms. O'Connell? Here. Dr. Pritchard? Here. Uh, Mr. Thomas? Here. Here. Mr. Tolles? Here. Ms. Wilbanks? Here. Chairman Sharp? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. I'd like to remind you that copies of today's agenda are located at the back of the room if you need them. If you wish to be a speaker on any case that is on today's agenda, please fill out an attendance speaker's card. Once you have filled out the card, please bring it up front to one of our OPD uh, staff members. When the agenda item is called, you will be given an opportunity to speak. At this point, I would like to read our conflict of interest. The adopted policy of the Land Use Control Board requires that any member of the board recuse himself or herself from any participation in the discussion or voting on any matter on the meeting agenda in which he or she may have direct or indirect personal interest. The member shall vacate his or her seat during deliberation on any matter from which they have recused themselves. An abstention may substitute for a recusal for the purposes of maintaining a quorum. I would like to now get approval of our minutes from last meeting. May I have a motion? Madam Chair, uh, on page two of the minutes, we need a correction at that top paragraph. She then introduced committee chair Gil Brown to read the consent agenda items. That should have been Lisa Wilbanks. And with that correction, I move we approve the minutes. I, there's another correction. <clears throat> On page 7, item uh, 17, it says that A's was 0, nay 7, item passes. I think that should be A7, nays 1, or, or nay 0, rather. I've noted both. We need a second. Second. Thank you. Okay. I have a second to approve the minutes as corrected. All those in, is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those against? Motion carries. <clears throat> okay, Mr. Whitehead, may I get a secretary's report? Uh, yes, ma'am. I, I did present my secretary's report at the executive session, uh, but again, we had uh, two members with perfect attendance, Dr. Pritchard and yourself, so thank you for everybody's commitment uh, to the board this year. And with that, I can go ahead and discuss uh, the process for this morning. At the beginning of our meeting, we will establish a consent agenda for those items where no one in the audience or on the board is requesting an individual public hearing. After the consent agenda is established and approved, we will move on to the regular agenda. For each case and on the regular for each case on the regular agenda, staff will provide a staff presentation at the right desk. This will be followed by, at the left desk, the applicant's presentation and any other testimony from supporters of that application. Following that, there will be uh, opponents who will be allowed to speak. Each side will be given a total of 10 minutes. After those sides are both heard, the applicant will have three minutes for rebuttal. Following all the presentation and after all parties have been heard, the board will ask any board members if they have any additional questions of any member who spoke. Uh, the purpose of this is because once we make a motion, have a second, and close the public hearing, the discussion is among the board members. So if there's any questions, uh, do those bef ask those before uh, a motion is made on the matter. Uh, once that is done, the public, once a motion is made, the public hearing is closed and the uh, board will deliberate. If an applicant or any speaker would like to be heard after the conclusion of the public hearing, or if a board member wishes to hear additional testimony, a two-thirds affirmative vote is required, and at that point we will give both sides equal amount of time. Uh, again, if any member of the audience wishes to speak on a matter, uh, there are speaker's cards by Mr. Ragsdale to your 
left. And uh, once you fill those out, that'll automatically remove you, remove the item from the consent agenda. As Ms. Wilbanks reads out the consent agenda, if we've erred in any way, if you filled out a card and we didn't make note, just raise your hand uh, and we will have a pu full public hearing on that. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, um, I will hand the floor back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Whitehead. The board is a supporter of community, community involvement and we welcome neighborhood comments and feedback. We are respectful of the fact that many of you have taken off work or adjusted your schedule to be here today, but we ask that your comments be made within the time frame allowed. If there are multiple speakers, please, not, please try not to be repetitive so as to make the most of your side's 10-minute time limitation. Lastly, I'd like to ask you all to silence your cell phones so as not to interrupt or disturb anyone during today's proceedings. With our procedures explained, I'm now going to move to the consent agenda, consent agenda, I'm sorry. I would like to introduce to my right, Ms. Lisa Wilbanks, who will be this morning's consent agenda chairperson. Ms. Wilbanks will read some of those items between one and eight as a consent agenda. Once the consent agenda is read, if you wish to discuss one of these items individually, please come forward and give us the item number and we will pull that case. We will then vote on the remaining consent agenda items as one vote, and following the vote, we will hear the cases that were pulled individually. Ms. Wilbanks, will you proceed, please? Yes, ma'am. Item number two, the request is to ratify, ratify the version of the Memphis 3.0 general plan approved by the Memphis City Council. Staff recommendation is approval. Item number three, case S19-30 in Capelville. Capelville. Request is a three-lot major subdivision at 5434 and 5654 homes. Staff recommendation is approval with conditions as amended. Item number four, case PD 18-23 in East Memphis. Request is a modification to Valley Brook PD to permit an 11-lot townhouse development at the southwest corner of Aladdin and Valley Brook. Staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Item number seven. Case PD 19-24, which is downtown. The request is a mixed-use development known as Union Row with the blocks bounded by Union Avenue, Danny Thomas Boulevard, Bill Street, and South 4th Street. Staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Thank you, Ms. Wilmanks. Anyone now wishing to pull a case from the consent agenda, that would be 2, 3, 4, and 7, please come forward and give us the item number. Okay. We have pulled items number one, five, six, and eight, and two, three, four, and seven will be on the consent agenda. Uh, the items on the consent agenda will now be voted on with one vote subject to the recommendation of OPD. If the consent agenda is approved, only those items I just mentioned will have full independent hearings, and those will be one, five, six, and eight. Can I get a motion, please? Yes, ma'am. Move to approve item number two. Item number three, case S19-30. Item number four, case PD18-23. And item number seven, case PD19-24. Second. I hear a second. Is there any discussion? Madam Chair, please show me recuse from item number seven, Union in row, please. Okay. We show Mr. Fleming recuse from item number seven. Is there any other dis discussion? Hearing none, I assume we're ready to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Dr. Pritchard, we're ready for the regular agenda. Agenda item number one, S19-23, Sea Isle, Yorkshire. Resubdivision of 1090 Haney. <clears throat> Staff recommends approval with conditions and waivers. Okay, is the applicant present? Would you come forward, please? Is there any opposition? Okay, I'm assuming the applicant uh, would like to state your name and address for the record and anything else you'd like to say. Uh, yes, uh, that's Bray, Bray from 2950 State. Uh, we, we have a speaker card on this. I believe at this point we have no opposition. Um, the developer and the neighborhood association have worked um, for the last 75 days trying to work through 
um, some conditions on this through some illness, through the holidays, through people being out of town. And thankfully, late last night, I think we got it all worked out. Um, staff has a copy of the agreement in the email. And um, so we pulled this off consent to make sure that that agreement is, is part of the record. There are six items on it. Um, I don't know that we need to read them, but we will add them to the recorded plat um, to, to, to um, formalize that agreement that they've reached. And other than that, I think we're in agreement. Jean, do you have anything else? <clears throat> Morning, I'm Jean McEnany, 1361 West Prestwood Drive, and um, I support this project uh, with the conditions um, and uh, with the proviso that they are recorded in the subdivision plat. Thank you. So the applicant is in agreement with the staff conditions and recommendations? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, Madam Chair, I would just make a recommendation that the motion to approve is as amended. Um, as discussed and with the revised preliminary plan that was disseminated at executive session. Okay. All right, so we do have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion amongst our board members? I'd just like to say thank you to the developer working with the neighborhood organization. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I assume we're ready to vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed? <clears throat> Motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Pritchard. Agenda item number five, PD19-16CO, once known as Z19-03CO, Southeast Shelby County, commercial plan development to permit a convenience store with gas sales at southeast corner of Hacks Cross and Holmes. Staff recommendation is rejection. Morning, everybody. Morning. Okay. Okay. Since this is rejection, we will hear. We'll hear the case. Ready for the staff presentation? I'm going to pull up this presentation. I'm not sure why it's not working. Button there. Trash bin. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Hmm. The, the PDF isn't opening. There it goes. Okay. Thanks for your patience. Uh, morning. Brett Davis with OPG. I'm going to present uh, our analysis of this application plan development 19 16. Let's go. Full page view. Okay, so this development is named the Holmes and Hacks Cross Plan Development. It's located at the southeast corner of the intersection of East Holmes Road and Hacks Cross Road. This is in unincorporated Shelby County. The land is owned by Mr. Michael A. Lightman Jr., represented by Ms. Brenda Salamito of Salamito Land Planning. And the request is a commercial planned development approval. Uh, to permit a convenience store with gas sales. The lot is 9.4 acres. Uh, obviously, only part of this is proposed to have the gas station. The applicant has proposed uh, leaving the rest of the land undeveloped. Uh, and the existing zoning is conservation agriculture. Here we see the location of the lot. Uh, let's note some jurisdictional boundaries. Uh, again, unincorporated Shelby County. To the west is City of Memphis, the Hickory Hill neighborhood. 
and to the east is Collierville, to the south is Olive Branch, Mississippi. Here's a vicinity map that shows uh, to whom we sent notices of public hearing. We mailed 29 notices of public hearing and received 41 letters of opposition. <clears throat> Here's an aerial photograph of the site. Um, it is a heavily wooded site. <coughs> Zoom out a little bit just to get a bigger picture of what we're looking at. Um, so this land is currently natural. In the immediate vicinity are large lot, rural, residential homes. Um, as you move out to the west and to the northeast, we do get into more suburban style residential developments. About 3,000 feet to the south, you hit State Line Road. And once you're in Mississippi, there are uh, industrial uses, distribution centers, to be more precise. We'll note that there is some agricultural activity uh, in this land, which is zoned conservation agriculture to the south, just north of the border, uh, and to the east as you head towards Collierville. Here's a zoning map. All the land around here is zoned conservation agriculture. All of these zoning entitlements have expired that you see on the screen. Um, and most were related to mobile homes being permitted back in the 1970s. Here's the land use map, uh, mostly residential uh, in the immediate vicinity, you know, a large lot residential, we do see some suburban style homes to the northeast. Uh, the red signifies commercial. The commercial all the way at the top is a pet cemetery. And to the west, I believe, is a catering business. Uh, the blue and purple down south uh, are a daycare uh, and another cemetery, a human cemetery. Uh, this just shows a map of all gas stations within one mile of the site. There are two uh, on Hacks Cross to the north. Some site photographs. Here's a view of the site. A uh, view down Hacks Cross Road. Uh, another view down, uh, you know, this is looking north down Hacks Cross. I will note, uh, and this is important, that there is a planned, an imminent planned improvement to Hacks Cross. It's currently two lanes at this point, um, but there is a planned widening, I believe, to six or seven lanes uh, from State Line Road all the way to uh, Shelby Drive, I believe. Um, this road has a reputation as being a fairly unsafe one. I think that plays a major role in uh, deciding to widen the road. Here's another view of that intersection. This is looking down Holmes Road, east down East Holmes Road. This is a house across the street from the site and the house directly to the east of the site. So let's take a look at the site plan and elevations. Here's the site plan. So we see the gas station and convenience store are proposed to be sited at the northwest corner of the site. Um, and we see a proposed septic field protruding from the south of the site. Uh, so that septic area would need to be denuded of trees. The rest of the land is proposed by the applicant to remain as is. Um, there are no commercial bays being proposed in the convenience store. Here are some elevations. Some site zoning history. In 2003, the Shelby County Commission and Memphis City Council jointly approved a planned development here known as PD03-304CC. This entitlement permitted the equivalent of commercial mixed use two uses with certain exceptions, including gasoline sales. So gasoline sales were not permitted on the site. Um, it was more of a shopping center uh, plan with multiple buildings. Unlike today, this land was then in the city of Memphis reserve and eligible for uh, sewer connections, enabling that sort of more intensive development. Today, um, the city of Memphis is not extending sewer to the site. This entitlement expired as no final plan was ever recorded. So in conclusion, and bear with me, I have a few. The applicant is requesting approval of a plan development to permit a, give, a convenience store with gas sales at the southeast corner of East Holmes Road and Hacks Cross Road. The convenience store would rely on a septic system. As a policy, the city of Memphis no longer extends sewer to this area in order to encourage centralized development. 
This heavily wooded nine acre site is zoned conservation agriculture and is surrounded by land that is also zoned conservation agriculture. It is adjacent on three sides to low density residential uses. Just over 1,000 feet to the south of the site are active agricultural uses, suggesting the continued viability of agriculture in this area. On the other hand, across the Mississippi, Mississippi state border, just over 3,000 feet south of the site is a complex of distribution warehouses. These warehouses produce a significant amount of truck traffic heading north of Pax Cross Road, and there is a planned widening of that road. The planned widening of Hacks Cross Road, however, is not in itself justification for the commercial rezoning of this land. In fact, the street's expansion and the area's proximity to Mississippi industrial uses indicate the need for heightened zoning protection of this neighborhood's agricultural and natural character. Natural, particularly on this piece of land and agricultural and residential surrounding. Permitting a convenience store in this location would lead to the potential commercialization of the remainder of this street corner. And this would happen without the guidance of a long range plan. The resultant sprawl would break down a desirable agricultural buffer between Olive Branch, Mississippi and urban development in Shelby County. The Conservation Agriculture District is intended to conserve agricultural land and undeveloped natural amenities while preventing the encroachment of incompatible land uses on farmland and other undeveloped areas. Um, and this goal, we believe, remains appropriate in this location. <clears throat> So this proposal would have an undue adverse impact on the character of the neighborhood and does not meet plan development criteria and standards. In conclusion, we are recommending rejection. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're ready for the applicant for your 10 minute presentation. Thank you. And supporters. I'm sorry, I thought opposition was first. No, applicant go first. Thank you. Uh, Brenda Salamito Baser, Salamito Land Planning, 1779 Kirby Parkway, Memphis. And uh, we have a handout uh, for you that we have um, worked on uh, probably for the past six or seven months. We've worked on the project, worked on the site plans, um, had a couple of meetings with the neighbors. OPD have, have really spent a fair amount of time evaluating the project, and it's taken several forms to the final form that you see today. And to begin the, we'll go ahead and give the presentation. Trying to get your slides up. Um, and as Mr. Davis stated, the, the site is located at the southeast corner of Hacks Cross Road and Holmes Road in the unincorporated area of Shelby County. Uh, the approximate radius for the closest convenience store with the sale of gasoline is about a mile away. Uh, the, the graphic that I presented here just kind of came short of that, but we have another one that shows more of a regional area where other uh, convenience stores with gas stations are located. But within, you know, three quarters of a mile, there, is, there isn't any retail services to accommodate the the residential residents of this area. There are no retail services. On the next page, you can see on the old plan development that was originally approved in 2003. It was approved for about 65,000 square feet of retail, plus an out parcel that would accommodate about 10,000 to 14,000 square feet. That plan development was approved for a time extension in 2011. <coughs> that plan development approved C2 uses. Back then it was called CP. The equivalent today would be C2. Now gasoline sales were not included as a part of that approval. However, our subsequent changes to our ordinances permit a gas station, gasoline sales with a convenience store, actually in C1, providing it meets the criteria necessary for it to be permitted at that corner. This development, this proposal does meet the criteria for the sale of gasoline, according to the UDC. So what we have, have done is, in conjunction with the developer and the Lightman family, if you can go to the next page, uh, 
and taking into consideration the neighbor's concerns and their, I guess, objections to this particular use, we have proposed there be one use on this property and only one use, and that would be the convenience store with the sale of gasoline. And there would be no other retail bays, there would be no car wash, there would be no future development on the surrounding properties. And that would be both through this plan development process and also through a deed restriction. So they are committed to being a sensitive neighbor and, and keeping the rest of it natural. The building will face Hacks Cross and it will be a self-contained site. There will be no accesses. There are a couple little stubs that we've shown, but we've they were supposed to be for future development, but since we've decided no more future development, we can either eliminate them or, or show them as a, a turnaround for trucks or for anyone who needs to back in and back out. So uh, the site plan is illustrative of a few state gas station locations that face hacks, and then also then the building itself will also be oriented towards. So, and it's about 262 feet from property line to residential property line. So over 250 feet between that will remain natural to the east. Other considerations are also lighting, and we've agreed to zero foot candles. So any, any lighting on site will not be visible from surrounding properties. There will be zero foot candles at the property line. So some building renderings here, 100% um, brick and masonry. Again, no retail bays. Uh, the neighbors requested that if approved that we provide a green standing seam roof and we've accommodated. It is a very residential in character uh, proposal and it will be the only development on the nine acres. There's another shot. So in looking at, at, at traffic, so I think we can all agree that there's been a change in the character of this area. The approval in 2003 and then again 2011 would have permitted you know 70,000 square feet or better of, of retail. With the distribution center in Olive Branch, you have over 25,000 cars per day at this one location, north and southbound on Hacks Cross. Thus, the need for this going from a two lane road to a seven lane road. This seven lane road will be approximately 114 feet of right of way. The developer would improve both Hacks and Homes as associated with this development. So we know that this is a, a probably maybe 10 year, five to 10 year uh, proposal for the, the right of way, but it is funded through the county CIP. So this will be happening. With the change in the character of the area, although there is no sewer, there won't be any sewer, maybe in our lifetime, that should not preclude or prohibit development from happening in an area. You know, probably half the state of Tennessee is developed without centralized sewer. But with this being the only development, we think that this proposal will not have a negative impact because of a lack of sewer or because of its nature of its use. And if you want to go to the next page, you can kind of see we've located where the other convenience stores and gas stations are and the average daily traffic counts. To give you a regional perspective of, yes, there are other in the area, but not unlike a Walgreens or a CVS, these types of uses locate at the corners of Maine and Maine. They generally require about 15,000 cars per day minimum for that location because they serve both a neighborhood and a regional clientele. So this actually does meet the criteria in the UDC for the location of this particular use. And 
but for a sewer policy, this area may develop more so in the future. I think there are there are some property owners that have bought property and they're going to leave it all natural. However, there may be some that would wish to develop that their properties in the future. And this development would not set a, a negative precedent. So when we look at the impact that this particular land use would have on surrounding properties, we basically look at traffic. So the traffic generated from this particular development and how it impacts the surrounding roadways. 66% of the traffic as it relates to this particular development is passed by traffic. It's already on the street. It is already going to where they're going and they're stopping in and then going on their way. The remainder would be destination that people from the neighborhood within a mile or so coming to this location specifically to visit this site. And then that's, that's it. You have one use, you have one site. So the majority of the impact <coughs> of the traffic is already there. And again, so we believe that this is not going to cause a detrimental impact to the surrounding properties. And again, we have the property owner here, we have the developer here. Should you have any questions about the history of the property or the proposal or how much we have coordinated with the neighbors? And, and I think the neighbors, we are in a position that we are in agreeing to disagree on this one. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions of the applicant? I have a, I have a question. Why, uh, Mr. Lightman, did you decide to restrict yourself for the remainder of the property? Wait, why do the deed restriction? Was that a neighbor? It, it was basically concession. for the neighborhood um, because it would have required you know, larger septic fields, which we would have had to take more trees down. Our goal was just to be able to have the largest buffer that we could have as far as the trees to you know, minimally impact the neighbors, you know, where they're not going to see it you know, from their homes. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we, we were able to Basically, the original um, plan of the septic field was towards the rear, so we could develop, and we realized that the neighbors were not happy with that at all. So we just gave up the right to uh, develop anymore at that uh, point, just, just trying to get this done. Gotcha. Thank you. Any other question of the applicants before we hear the opposition? I have a question. I don't know if it's for the applicant or, or who can answer it, uh, but in terms of widening the road from a two lane to a possibly seven lane where is how is that being done where is the land coming from i mean that's that's a lot of land so, right. so i think if you look at our conditions um it may or may not say but generally speaking we would have to dedicate a certain amount of property from the center line of the existing road so with the final section, when the final section gets designed, that would be up to us. And then I think, um, you know, Josh, please take it from there, other than I know what we would have to do in order to accommodate that road section. Right. And my question is because the way this looks here, it seems that it's built right up to the road. But if, if within five or ten years land is being taken away, my guess is that this would have to be pushed back. Or we'd consolidate to accommodate the dedication. Because that, that would be a lot that you would have to <coughs> consolidate. I mean, my understanding is that this site has already dedicated the no, land that is required for the that's, widening. Yeah, that's um, correct. Okay. We own the parcel across the street. We've already dedicated. So, it, so, okay. so all this has already been wide. So it's all. But it's it's still two oh, lanes, so, but it's a very wide. So Paved section. So they, won't, they won't come. They don't need any more of this ground. All the way back to here. So the right of way is in place. Yeah, it will not change any of the curb. And cut okay. Okay. Hearing no other questions for the applicants, we are ready for the opposition. And I do have one card of opposition. If you would come forward and state your name and address. Thank you. And give us your information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good morning. My name is Jerry Cavanaugh. 
I live at 8121 Holmes Road. Uh, been there for about 15 years, and I'd like to speak to the opposition, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. I'll probably be a little emotional. Uh, I'm a business guy here in town, but this is not business. This is about our family. And I, and I, I got to say, I listened to this gentleman's presentation, and I don't really think there's really much I can add to that, so I would like to ask you, if I may, to show the film again of the neighborhood with sure. the uh, agriculture. You had, uh, could you zoom in? Yeah, that's perfect. Back, uh, back if you don't mind. Okay. There. Oh, it disappeared on us. This one? Yes, please. Okay. If you look at that, that's all agriculture, and most of you guys have driven down Axe Road going into, uh, or coming into Shelby County. Uh, most of us that move there, move there, we're elder people that move there because of what you're looking at. It was a nice area that's, it's uh, mostly agriculture, it's quiet. Uh, and when I think of zoning, and I don't know anything about zoning, I'm thinking of improvements for the community, basically. And that part of the end, the, that's the end of Shelby County, as I'm sure everybody knows here. And it's all agriculture, that, and it's only the, kind of the last piece, and that's why we moved there, as many of the people that <laughs> sent in e emails, that's why they moved there. It's, it's kind of a quiet place for us to retire and kind of live out the rest of our lives there. And so when we hear they're going to add a service station, not, not in a strip mall, not in an area that service stations are usually protected by other businesses, but just dropping a service station in the middle of an agriculture and residential area, then we all started figuring out how we can move somewhere else. And then I personally decided, yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to flee. I want to stay and protect my neighborhood. So I don't have a lot of handouts, but I think that this gentleman presented the case probably better than I ever could by saying it's a, it's a kind of one of the last little areas that is residential. We have three service stations. If, if I could hit a nine iron good, I could hit them with a nine iron. So there's not a need in the community for a service station. If there was a need that we need a service station, then I'd be the first guy to say, let's put a service station. But there's a service station and convenience store just down the road, e either way you turn. And there's two empty service stations that are being built that aren't even completed yet on Holmes Road that are actually shut down. They're not, I don't know if it's lack of finances or if it's predatory pricing. And the, the service station just down the road shut down for four or five months because of predatory pricing for the service station that opened just down the street from it. And it was down three or four months, and there's nothing in your neighborhood that looks worse than a service station that's closed. And you can't, you can't cl clear the ground because it's got gas tanks under it. At this particular service station is talking about building a sewer, sewer or septic systems to, ha to handle 1,000 or 2,000 people a day or whatever their forecast is in my backyard. I live on the back of the property. I don't have a anything that's pointed at, but I'll show you quickly, is my home, the home that you see that's kind of in the back bottom, which is where the landfill would be that would have the septic. We all know the septic things are uh, occasionally are going to go bad, no matter how good they are. So I'll have a septic tank 200 feet from my house that's huge, that's going to smell if it goes bad. And I don't have to... I don't have a lot of handouts, but I'll just show you briefly. This comes from the uh, Earth Health, and this says, is it safe to near live near a gas station? And their findings is no. And this is from the Environmental Protect Protection. Our gas stations are toxic neighbors. Now, it means if you live day in and day out with your children and grandchildren all day long, next door, and we, we're next door. There's no land between us and the service station. These neighbors here, they're, they're 
zero feet block line at, from the gas station. I'm 200 feet from the gas station. And the EPA says it is environmental dangerous to live 24 hours a day closer than 300 feet from gas pumps because of the toxic chemicals. So obviously we don't want that. And I'm gonna try to, they've asked me to be brief and I'm gonna try to be brief, so I apologize. I'm gonna go down a short list real quick that you, we all know. The real question I think you ask yourself is, from, from the city standpoint and the county standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This gentleman presented that case. And from our neighborhood and from a, from a, just a citizen's viewpoint, it makes no sense at all. Some of the reasons, the blight impact that service station would have is your neighbor. The community impact, the crime impact, the health benefits and health in impacts negatively. The resources, historic resources impact, the light lighting, the noise impact, the predatory pricing, which would have stations opening and closing. Because I talked to one of the station owners and he told me straight up, he would go into predatory pricing. He's going to lower his prices, try to put them out of business. He said, that's what we do. The property value impact. I want to live there the rest of my life. He said, I hope he's another 10 or 20 years. Our property values, obviously, you don't want to live next door to a gas station. I don't mean on the same street. I mean next door to a gas station. Your property values is obviously are going to plummet. The traffic impact, the accidents that already happen on packs and homes, that road is closed off occasionally. And I was talking about four laning or six laning. I mean, that's great, but that doesn't have anything to do with this much. They four lane or six lane, I mean, great. That's, we want it. But don't let that have anything to do with putting the gas station on the corner in front of my house. There's, that has little to do with that. The visual impact of the stations when they close down. Uh, there's three unfinished gas stations currently. From the crime standpoint, the FBI justice crimes, they just got off the internet. There are 17,000 crimes in convenience stores and 8,178 crimes in service stations. According to the National Fire Protection Association, there's 5,000 gas station fires a year, 48 injuries, two deaths on an average per year. 2% of all robberies in the United States occur at gas stations. 6.8% of all crime in the United States occurs in convenience stores. And we're talking next door, not down the street. All these statistics together recommend gas stations are not recommended in residential areas near homes and children due to crime and increased health risk. And that's really all I got to say is I live there. If you live there and you were standing here, what would you be saying? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from the opposition? Yes, I have a, I have a okay. comment. You had me with nine iron. Yeah. I, I think you may need a seven, though. <laughs> uh, I feel you pain in that one. I, I have one that's been built by our place that has never been finished. It's just blighted land there now, so I, I understand what you're saying. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yes. I would like for, uh, I, we have several letters of opposition, and I would like for those who are present in opposition to stand so we can see who you are. Obviously, a lot of our people are at work. Or yeah. work and you can't get off right, I understand. Okay. But I All think right. there is 41 in the mail. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Okay. If there aren't any other questions, we'll have the applicant with her three-minute rebuttal. And we will we will make this this very brief. <clears throat> so again, there's there's not any service or retail within a mile of this site. There is a substantial change coming to the area, in the area, with a seven-lane road. The negative impacts to the neighborhood, well, first of all, you have vacant land. So you could put anything there, a park, and it's going to have an impact 
on surrounding properties. But the question is, is what would we do to help mitigate those impacts? Well, I think not developing the, the seven other acres of the property, leaving the rest of it natural buffer, and, and doing everything with regard to the lighting and the traffic to minimize any impacts that you have. As compared to what was approved, which would have been over 70,000 square feet of retail. And I, I, I can't necessarily even address the statistics. I don't know the source. I don't know, I don't know anything about the statistics that our, our opposition proposed, but I do have the developer's representative here who has a huge investment in Memphis and Shelby County and has done a number of other stores here. And I think he would be more than willing to guarantee that, you know, it's not gonna go dark. John? Uh, yes, uh, John Benke, 1164 Brookfield uh, in Memphis. I, the, we're dedicated to being a good neighbor. Uh, every single request that came out of the neighborhood meetings, we've accommodated. They're built into the plan that have before you. We are also open to anything else that the neighbors might request. I think the, the largest item that shows that we're doing our best to be a good neighbor on, by, by physical appearances is a commercial corner, is on 9.6 acres, we are only taking up an acre and a half. And on the, the map that you have before you, from the edge of our development, it is 300 feet of woods. To give you a concept of that, that's basically from the front of this building down to Riverside is 300 feet, full of trees. So the, there is no visual impact to the neighbors from their homes, um, and we're doing our best to preserve the agricultural nature on the balance of the land. In addition, the, the building it, itself is high-end, uh, highest quality. If there are any additional requests from you or the county commission or the neighbors, we're happy to accommodate that. In addition to your concern, um, we will uh, be happy to pull a bond on the construction. That is no problem. So we, were, we will guarantee that that building will be built and we'll put that into the record for bonding. So um, those are the highlights, but we, we wanna do all we can do to make this a convenient store and handsome and, um, and neighborly to everybody that's close by, plus all the people that would on the existing traffic. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from the uh, from us for uh, anybody before I close the public portion of the meeting? Do you have any questions from the app for the applicant or the opposition? Any board members have any questions? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to close the public portion of the meeting and turn it back over to Dr. Pritchard. Move approval of agenda item number five, case number PD 19-16CO. Second. It has been moved and I hear a second. Is there any discussion? Board members, any yes. discussion? Ms. Yes. Um, I think that the developer did a very good job in trying to work with the neighbors and, you know, really structure this project as sensitive as possible. However, I, I'm still, I, I feel that the findings of the Office of Land Development, I, I respect your findings and I, I'm persuaded by the findings of the office as opposed to the developer. And I just feel that the negatives in this project outweigh the positives. So I would not be supporting this project. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Madam Chair, I, I uh, want to echo Ms. O'Connell's comments too. I think the applicants done a great job to protect the neighbors. Um, the, the concern I've got is just the, um, it's not the precedent as much. If those roads were already in place, I'd feel much better about uh, supporting this application with the protection that they provided. I just think it's a little premature uh, before those roads are in place for me personally to support. So again, I want to commend the applicant. You know, these we see these applicants down here a lot and they do the, the right thing. And I, I think they've done the case here. But uh, in this case, after hearing all the merits of the case, I think I'm going to um, 
be voting against this. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I assume we're ready to vote. All in favor? Yes, I'm in favor. Okay, all in favor? We have one in favor. All opposed? No. no. Motion fails, I'm sorry. Agenda item number six, PD 19-23CO, Southeast Shelby County, 543 lots on 177 acres on the east side of Quinn Road, south of Shelby Drive. Staff recommendation is approval with conditions. The applicant is present, and we're going to have a presentation. It's a market-based decision. Uh, good morning, board members. This is PD 19-23. Uh, um, the owner applicant is uh, Martha Mann Murrow, Quinn Road Partners. Uh, the development's name is the Quinn Ridge Plan Development. They're being represented by the Reeves firm. So the location's on the east side of Quinn Road, just north of the state line. Um, it comprises of two different parcels. Parcel one is 42 acres, parcel two being 135 acres. And the request is a 543 unit single family residential plan development. I believe this is the second time you guys are seeing this. I believe the only board member not present in the last one was uh, Chairman Gill. Chairman. Or board member. <laughs> board member. Uh, so here's the location um, just south of Collierville. And um, as you can see, relatively close to the state line. Um, the, the area around the property is all zoned CA. And the area north of the property has actually been annexed into the, the city of Collierville. Um, so the development proposal is uh, 543 lots, single family development. It's marketed to seniors and empty nesters, but is also open to all um, people that are looking to buy homes there. And the water and sewer is going to be provided by Marshall Utility Services um, as the part of the Chickasaw um, agreement. It also serves parts of Piperton, Tennessee, as the county is currently no longer, or the city of Memphis is no longer extending water or sewer to unincorporated areas. Um, here's the site plan. Uh, as you can see, relatively large scale development um, with entrances off of Quinn Road, and then in the future, entrances to Quad County Road, which borders the highway to the uh, east of the development. Um, there will also uh, be three areas of formal space amenities, uh, pool, clubhouse, parks, that type of thing. So community concerns, no letters of support uh, were received by this uh, or for this ap uh, application. And by the time the letters were due, I received 12 of opposition. However, the weekend um, in between the due date and, and now I received 16 additional letters of opposition. Um, and the main concerns with the opposition are the, the character of the area, the, the rural low density um, character of the area, the traffic impact mostly on Quinn Road in the first phases of the development, as Quinn Road is just a two lane rural road. And then also infrastructure capacity, um, emergency services, sewer water, those types of things. Um, so here's the uh, proposed entry coming off of Quinn Road. That's sort of, and that's sort of the developer's uh, idea for sort of having a screening from being able to actually see the, the density and scale of the development from Quinn Road that it will be based off of. Um, and here's the, the intersections included in the, the traffic impact study. There was the Quinn Road entrance 
the Quinn Road and Shelby Drive intersection and then Highway 72 and Shelby Drive. Um, and a traffic impact study was done. However, uh, I believe county engineering has requested for um, the applicants to do another traffic study. I just included the, the old one as an example of what was done previously. Um, here's the fiscal impact for, for the county um, expenditures at 955,000. Uh, with revenue at 2.7 million, so the net fiscal impact comes out at 1.8 um, million dollars. And so the conclusion, the applicant is seeking to waive certain standards applicable to the Conservation Agriculture District, which serves as the basis of this PD. So the stack uh, recommends conditions to minimize any potential adverse effects to the neighborhood and public facilities and ensure compatibility of the proposed development with the surrounding properties and uses. However, based on the plan development approval criteria, the staff believes that the residential plan development is appropriate to the future growth that will be taking place in that area. Um, so the staff's recommendation is approval with conditions. Thank you. We're ready for the applicant to make your presentation. Name and address and presentation. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Gerald Lawson. I'm the attorney for the uh, applicant, uh, Clean Road Partners. I have with me uh, Mr. John Porter, the primary partner. My address is 275 South Walnut Bend, Suite 100, uh, Memphis 38018. Um, again, we uh, have also been working on this matter for several years now. I know this board has seen it before, the majority of you. Uh, I've been approved to the county commission. I do have uh, the Reeves firm has been working with us, and Dr. Martin Lipinski are all here available. They prepared the plans and the traffic studies, and if we have any other questions, they can be available to answer questions from the board. But it not rehashing everything that the uh, presentation went through, but it is 543 lots. It's a density unit of about three units per acre, about 175 acres, uh, bordered by I-269 on the east side, Quinn Road on the west side. Um, it is south of Collierville, uh, but not in the Collierville. It, it is in what would formerly be known as the Collierville Reserve area, um, but it is, there have been significant changes to the uh, annexation laws um, over the last several years. So now uh, cities uh, are no longer allowed to annex by ordinance, by right. They have to do it at the request of the property owner. Um, the, uh, that was not the intent, currently is not the intent. Uh, since this matter has been brought up, was approved by the county commission at this plan with a few conditions uh, in October, um, August of 2018, um, was approved uh, this basic plan that came back before this board before. Uh, Mayor Luttrell had vetoed it at the last minute. Um, in negotiations we had been with the neighborhood and with Kyerville, uh, just to bring you up on what has happened since then. Uh, we did have several meetings with Kyerville, uh, with the neighborhood, and we believed what we had, this is apples to oranges. It was a completely different plan with a annexation request into Kyerville, which we thought we had a plan worked out with them. Uh, time period, it took about a year and a lot of planning to go through. Uh, that has sub subsequently been denied by Kyerville, so we're back uh, before you not requesting to go or be annexed into Cairoville at any point in the future to stay in Shelby County and go back to revert to the plan that was previously approved by the County Commission. Like I say, with utilities provided uh, from Marshall County, which there's precedent already set with the city of Piperton, um, you know, <coughs> water and sewer. Um, the, uh, the issues of Quinn Road um, traffic have uh, been brought up by the neighbors and the concerns. We believe we addressed that. Uh, Dr. Martin Lipinski uh, has done a very detailed study of the traffic flows. He's uh, been a professor at the University of Memphis, been expert in this matter for uh, 30 something years. The, uh, the overall impact that was rationally related to this project on Quinn Road or Highway 72 interchange uh, is still gonna be at a levels A and B for uh, signalization uh, coming through and the access and use of the road. So we don't believe that while there will be obviously more traffic over there, it's nothing that those roads can't handle in coming through with future development. Uh, if there's something that needs to be updated, we'd be happy to do that before the, you know, address anything before the county commission meetings. But I'd like to reserve any other time just to answer questions or have, uh, we have our other engineers here or Mr. Porter to address uh, any other concerns or questions? Thank you. Do we have any questions of the applicants before I bring the? Uh, 
I have, position. I have one question. Y'all worked diligently with Kyerville. And as part of that plan, you submitted a, uh, there was a 400 lot plan. It, it was less dense. It was, your lot yield was lower and that it was higher density at 269 and then it lowered as it got to Quinn. Why not come back through, I guess, other than the lot yield? Uh, what were your reasons for coming back with this plan at this density? Well, I, like you say, I, <laughs> And it's hard to explain, except that it's really not, we're not comparing apples to apples. This is apples to oranges. These are two totally different developments. We took this development, scrapped it, came up with a new development that honestly that would kind of been negotiated out what we wanted, what Kyerville wanted to see in their future growth related to their small area plan. We tried to relate things in. And it was higher density on the one side, triplexes, townhomes. Mm -hmm. uh, we had originally proposed triplexes. They uh, came up, the uh, staff had recommended townhomes. There were some larger units to the uh, west. Uh, it was more of a traditional suburban neighborhood uh, geared at a totally different uh, market. This is an age targeted market that Mr. Ford has been very successful in <clears throat> selling in this part of the county and other areas that are smaller, made for empty nesters. They're not age restricted, but they're age targeted. They're at a higher end level. These are going to be while 2,500 square foot minimums. They sell on average of 160 to 180 dollars per square foot. They're going to be half million dollar homes. The main advantage and difference in this is with this being in Shelby County, it doesn't have the um, ability to go to Kyerville schools without a transfer. Mm -hmm. And so this is a product that's targeted with people, empty nesters or people without children necessarily. Not to say that people couldn't move in, but that is a different product uh, geared towards more of a suburban area and people going to Kyerville schools. Thank you. So. Any other questions of the applicant before I bring the opposition? We have six, we have quite a few cards of opposition. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay, we're ready for the opposition. And like I say, we have 10 minutes for the many cards that we have here. So try to make it specific. We need your name, address, and... Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Stan Joyner, and I am the mayor of the town of Kyerville. And I'm here today representing the town of Kyerville. And I am speaking on behalf of uh, the entire board of mayor and aldermen uh, in opposition to this uh, application. <clears throat> uh, this is, as it's been pointed out, in our annexation reserve area. Uh, I've got 32 years of experience in land planning in the town of Kyrville. I've served uh, since 1987 uh, and served as mayor for three terms, alderman for three terms, but on the planning commission for, uh, for 12 years prior to that. I've been involved in all the planning that has gone before uh, or in the past uh, that the town of Kyrville has done, <clears throat> and we have planned everything. Uh, we have a small area plan for this area. Uh, uh, and it is uh, in conflict with, with both of those. As it's already been stated, you saw this application, this very same application, and in July of 2018, uh, and uh, denied it uh, with a vote of eight to one. Uh, we uh, submitted a letter uh, 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 stating what our opposition to uh, this development is. I uh, hope you've had the opportunity to look at that uh, in your packet, I'd point out just a couple of highlights on it. Uh, obviously, the infrastructure, which has already been mentioned, <clears throat> coming from uh, uh, from another state uh, into Shelby County or something and into the town of Kyrville's annexation reserve, which still does exist. Those reserve areas are still there. Uh, <clears throat> is a great concern to the town of Kyrville. Uh, the lack of control that the state of Tennessee and Shelby County would have over uh, that utility coming in from a, from a, another state uh, is, is something of great concern to us. We don't know how uh, you would be able to regulate uh, the uh, regulate the quality of the work that's done, uh, the safety of the work that's done, and the health of the work that's done. Uh, the uh, the design standards uh, would not be up to the town of Kyrville's design standards on on any of those issues. Uh, and as I said, that's a great concern. Uh, the, the plan, as I stated, does not comply with the town's adopted land use plan. And I hope you all had the opportunity uh, to review this letter. It's very 
uh, very detailed in what it, it's going to do, but I'll just point out those highlights to you. Uh, as I said, we've got, uh, we've got two plans that deal with this. Uh, the gross density of this area is 543 single-family dwellings on 177. That's 3.6 units per acre. So uh, I point that out to say that it's just entirely too dense uh, for, uh, for that particular area, especially when you're uh, bringing infrastructure in from other, from other areas. It's uh, already stated it's incompatible with, uh, with our land use plan, uh, and uh, that's of great concern to us. The transportation uh, impacts on it, uh, the traffic, uh, if you'll note on the map there, uh, Quinn Road is a, is a rural uh, road. Uh, it's probably 30 feet of asphalt. Uh, it is in the town of Cairoville. We, we've annexed that. We've annexed two or three other properties on Quinn Road uh, that are not reflected on that map. Uh, but <clears throat> we will not allow construction traffic to travel down Quinn Road in and out of the site. <clears throat> um, the, I think the, uh, the other issue of, of utmost concern, uh, and we've already talked about the school impact and what that means for Shelby County, is that if there are school-aged children in that area, they will go to a Shelby County school. I think the closest school to, to that was, was probably South Wind. Uh, so you're talking about quite a commute for uh, children that live in that area to go to, to schools. Of utmost concern is the emergency response. Uh, as has been stated, uh, this is going to be marketed to a to a senior uh, to a senior clientele. The uh, which means that on emergency response, you're going to have a lot more ambulance calls uh, than you would necessarily fire calls. Uh, currently, uh, the town of Cairoville services that area under a mutual aid agreement with Shelby County, which uh, we will no longer do. Uh, based under 543 lots in that area. That agreement was just not designed to have that type of impact on, on our fire services area, which is also our ambulance service. I think the closest uh, fire, fire department to that area would be at Forest Hill Irene and Shelby Drive, which is probably a 10 minute drive. Uh, and so on an ambulance call or even a fire call, uh, if they are in the station and if they are uh, ready to go to work, uh, you're looking at best at a 10 minute call. If they're out on the call, there's no telling what the response time could be. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> with the fire uh, protection there. Uh, we, we, and we currently, uh, as I said on the mutual aid agreement, uh, provide that service not on regular patrols for police, but, uh, but a call that would come in would come to us from Shelby County uh, to make that call there. And we won't continue to do it because, as I said, that agreement was just not based on that amount of density in that particular area. So, in closing, uh, I would just say that, uh, you know, that the town, uh, as, it, as uh, Mr. Lawson pointed out, has spent many hours over the last year working with the applicant. And there have been concessions that have been made on both sides of that. But we're still at a point of impasse. Uh, and we're not just necessarily looking at that one area, but Collierville has a lot of area in annexation reserve that this would set a very bad precedent uh, on us being able to deal with those areas as they come and want to develop. Uh, the, uh, after that, uh, and, and you know, John has done, Mr. Porter's done a lot of development in Collierville and, and it's, a, it's quality work that he does. Uh, and I'm not saying anything about that, but the density in this particular area, along with it being in the south, uh, in the southeast corner, southeast corner of Shelby County, is going to make it very difficult for Shelby County to provide any services there. So, in closing, uh, for the town of Cairoville, I would ask that you deny uh, this application. And any questions? I'll be happy to ask, answer any. I do have a question for sure, Mayor Joyner. You you caught the. The reserve area doesn't exist, but you still are under the same 2015 state law for annexing, for annexation, for annexation which right. would require either a property owner signature or a referendum. Uh, correct. So if any of these property owners decide not to be a part of Kyerville, right. do you, I guess, what is Kyerville's plan, regardless of what the Porter family does? Exactly. What is Kyerville's plan to annex when... Tennessee has really stripped these municipalities yeah. of 
Well, that, that's, that's unless it's by uh, uh, request of the property owner. We have annexed five or so properties. In fact, annexed the property directly uh, across from the entrance uh, to uh, this development uh, back last year. So mm. uh, as they come in with requests, obviously we're going to listen to that request. And, and if we can provide a, the plan of services that we need to provide for that area, then we will certainly take them in. When Mr. Porter came to the town of Cairoville with his application, he also came with a request to be annexed. Yes, sir. So it would be, you know, based on that type of situation. So, uh, uh, you know, as I said, based on where it is, and if you'll notice that map, uh, our city limits is right next to, uh, on, the, on the south side, is right next to this development, that pink shaded area. So our, our our city limit goes to that area. It would yes. be very er, it would be very easy for yeah. the town of Collierville to provide services to that area, but obviously it's got to be inside the you know the city limits in order for us to do that. Yes, sir. So, and you know as I said, we worked diligently, uh, spent many hours uh, in our planning staff uh, over the past year uh, to try and make that plan work, and I. I you know, I'm an optimist at heart. I feel like that that at some point in the future we could come to an agreement, but it's got to fall more in line with what our land use plan is. Uh, as I said, because that's something that, uh, you know, we, we've worked many, many hours to develop that. Uh, it's fair. It's consistent. Uh, this is not consistent, okay? So we've got to bring it in line where we're, we're prepared to, uh, to use that as a precedent, we'll say, uh, in the event other areas come in uh, and, and request, uh, you know, a development like that. Thank you, Mayor Jordan. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, we have four more uh, okay. cards of opposition. Madam, you have a problem. Madam Chair, I have, I have, I'm sorry. One question for the mayor. Sure. Because uh, he's much more familiar with annexation law than I am, mm -hmm. being that Memphis doesn't really annex anymore. Right. Uh, go back to the referendum approach. Right. I guess this is kind of a provocative question, but something. <clears throat> For the room to consider yeah. is the referendum approach to annexation one man one vote in other words uh one property owner one vote or one acre one vote i assume that it would be one owner one vote so there's one ways owner, to get vote. to 51 percent without a hundred percent owner approval correct thank uh, you I, and i believe that th that that is correct yes Okay, thank you. That's sure. that's important. Thank you. All right, we have four more letters of, of cards of opposition. You have approximately a minute and a half oh. each. So would you come forward, please? Yes, ma'am. Come up, give us your name, address, so I can recognize your card. Good morning, honorable members of the board. My name is Tanya Hodges. I live at 11266 Country Forest Cove in Cairoville, Tennessee. Um, the uh, neighborhood I live in is approximately within a mile of this planned development. So we're right at Holmes and Bahalia Road. Um, interestingly enough, I live in a neighborhood with about 24 households that was also developed by Mr. Porter roughly about 20 years ago from what I'm being told. Um, my husband and I moved there because we wanted um, to have a home on a larger lot. And if you look at the uh, slide that's still being displayed, you can see that um, this is an area that allows you to have more of a lifestyle that's conducive with, you know, horses and, and those kinds of things. So most of the properties adjoining this development are actually, you know, used for that specific purpose. And a lot of our neighbors had to search for quite some time in Shelby County to find a property where they could pursue that lifestyle. So I want to say, um, first of all, I want to thank the mayor for standing with us on this. Um, I've been involved in this project for the past two years. There's only one meeting I've missed. And I want to say that we are just very concerned with the density and what it will do to our neighborhood. I also want to say that Mr. Porter built our entire neighborhood and uh, built it in accordance to the 269 plan. And we're very happy with that. We actually love our neighborhood, and um, we would love for him to build something that is more fitting with the current character of it. The other thing I want to point out to you guys is um, the traffic study that you're looking at in your package actually was done, I believe, before the high school was opened up. 
So to us, those numbers are no longer reflecting current traffic patterns. I can tell you that traffic has substantially increased since then. The other point that I would like to make uh, while I have a few minutes of your time is that there's also an industrial complex that's being planned just on the other side of Point Road, uh, just across the state line, also um, something that Mr. Porter's involved in. Um, to take that into account uh, and the traffic patterns and the, the proximity of this development to this industrial complex um, would lead us to believe that the people that are going to be working there are going to be living, obviously, close by. So the statement that this development is for empty nesters just doesn't hold any truth. We are extremely concerned about traffic um, and emergency services. Um, I can tell you that, um, you know, if you call 911 in our neighborhood, I expect about a 25 to 30 minute delay. We've had situations where that was the case because um, we get bounced around, you know, from, from the county to, from Shelby County to Cuyahoga and so on and so forth. So emergency services are a problem. And we are, uh, from a homeowner's insurance <coughs> perspective, because we have no utilities that are provided. And as the mayor pointed out, the closest fire station is at Shelby and Forest Hill. Uh, we are in a fire zone nine or 10. Those are the same premiums that people in Arizona and New Mexico pay for homes. So we pay a, an insurance premium for the houses we live in, but we do so, we see it as a trade-off um, because we, we love the lifestyle that we have. So again, traffic patterns, emergency services, and the destruction of the character of our, our um, homes is what <laughs> we're most concerned about. And in closing, I would like to point out that we have all met numerous times with the developer. I've been at many meetings. Many suggestions were made. Unfortunately, none of them, you know, came to fruition. So we have tried diligently as well um, to work with the developer. We are not against progress. We're not against development of the property. We just would like to see something that falls more in line with the character of our neighborhood. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your time. Thank you. We're going to hear from the other three before we start the questions on the opposition. Uh, can we have the uh, another person who submitted a card, please, in opposition? We have three more cards. I'll be, I'll be very brief. Um, your my name? My name is Brent Myers. I live at 11765 Holmes Road. And I guess I'd ask, does anybody know who Sisius is? You guys remember your Greek mythology? Mm -hmm. Mom, we're in high school now. Mm -hmm. It's in multiple choice. Sisyphus was given the task, the punishment, of pushing a rock up a hill. And it reaches the top of the hill, and the rock comes back down. Well, here we are the fourth time going through this again. The second time for you. And it's like Sisyphus, we'd kind of like to understand, I guess what I'm saying is when does this stop? I guess he can put this application in. We have made suggestions. We have asked for improvements. Now, the one thing the council did approve last year, which I guess we had to live with, was a reduced number of homes. But also with the caveat that the, that the Holmes Road exit could only be used for emergency vehicles. Pardon? Quinn Road. Road. I'm sorry, Quinn Road. So that puts a high density thing using a high density area called 72. What it does is it protects the entire Quinn Road area, protects all the bikers, all the joggers, and all the people that live along there. It isolates it and puts kind of like a cocoon around it and forces everything out on 72. That was a compromise we had last year. So I just tell you that's as far as we got the rock last year, we're right back pushing the rock again. So thank you for your time. Thank you. We have two more cards. Name and address, please. Uh, my name is Robert Slaughter. I live at 1640 Quinn Road. Uh, our property uh, uh, borders this, this property. Um, the, um, just a couple things I wanted to say here is um, I was kind of comparing this to just the previous case here and how there was vacant land and things like that around this area and, and how you guys considered uh, the character and those kind of things. All up and down Quinn Road, these are live, healthy farms. 
there's there's this property and there's one property to the north that's basically vacant on our road so these are uh, healthy farms um, this is we just don't feel this is the right place for this at this time and um, that's all I got to say about that the um, also it just seems like this is kind of like pushing the rock up the hill here or putting a square in a, in a round hole it just seems to be um, there's a lot of a lot of confusion here bringing water in from other states uh, we're, uh, problems with the Carterville uh, reserve plans and 269 plans that we were part of 12 years ago and um, anyway we're we're all happy in this area and uh, we you know we don't we're not saying we don't want development but we just want development that uh, we agreed to you know 12 years ago we spent a lot of time making that plan and we think this would be good for the county and uh, for the future residents and none of us are in a big hurry to to leave this area so thank you thank you we have one more Head of the board, thanks for listening to us today. My name is Matthew Lotz. I live at 1654 Pecan Ridge Drive in the Collarville Reserve. It's about a mile, mile and a half uh, west southwest of the proposed uh, community. I live on about a uh, four acre property in our uh, neighborhood, uh, Pecan Ridge. It's about four to six acres uh, layout, uh, mostly just uh, rural areas. And uh, we've got a uh, wife and daughter. Uh, we uh, typically keep horses on the property, not right now. We're shopping for another one, and we have some dogs. And so when I'm looking at this plan, uh, as I said, uh, I'm not uh, the, the animal lover in the family. It's my wife and daughter. I'm always looking at ways of, okay, how do we support something like this? And when I brought up this uh, plan to a friend of mine, uh, Tim Werner, about a year ago, he works over at Fisher Arnold. He's a civil engineer, and I was telling him how they're going to uh, get the uh, water and sewage support. First thing that came out of Tim's mouth, I said, well, is this going to be by contract? And I said, yes. He said, well, what's going to happen, say, 10, 15 years down the road if uh, that uh, uh, utility in Marshall County decides not to renew the contract or they go bankrupt or they take their business someplace else? So that's a great question. So pretty much all the properties that are in this area, all our neighbors, we operate with uh, well water and then we operate either with a septic field or some type of septic pond. And that's basically how we take care of these needs. And so right now the plan is, is if uh, is the uh, utilities can be provided by Marshall County. So you have to ask yourself, well, what if, what if 10, 15 years down the road that the, uh, the, that utility is not gonna be able to provide it anymore? And the thing is, if you take a look at the density in there, there is no backup plan. Obviously the county has determined, just right out of the staff plan, that this is not gonna be supportable from Shelby County. Uh, the uh, city of Colorado has already said that based on just the density, they're not going to do it. So there is really is no other option to get that uh, essential sewage and the water. So it's not just taking care of the sewage and having drinking water, but that water is also needed to provide fire support. When you've got an area that's dense, is that then the only way to deal with a fire is those trucks have got to bring out the water internally. And if anybody has ever dealt with a fire uh, out in a, a rural area like that, uh, I, I'll tell you, you're, you're kind of on your own. And all you can really do is kind of contain the area. And so the only fire support we have outside of the city of Collarville is, as the mayor uh, pointed out, it's coming from Forest Hill, Irene. And so th there is no backup plan to this if for some reason that, that those water and sewage goes away, you know, come from Marshall County. And so there, you know, there is a plan in place, the I-269 plan, that the neighbors support, that the city of Collarville supports, and it's written in there, that's gonna be a much lower density than this. Uh, neither this plan nor the plan that was offered uh, by the developers met the I-269 requirements. Okay, the neighbors are willing to listen to this. They've been willing to listen to alternate plans. The city of Collarville is. It's just, as I'll just re-echo again what my neighbors have said, it just, it just can't be this dense. It's just, it's non-supportable. My concern is down the road, if for some reason those water and sewage goes away to a development like this, those homes are gonna be there and there's gonna be somebody living in there, but it's not gonna be the nicest people, okay? People that are gonna be living in there, don't have water, don't have sewage, it's gonna turn into a disaster. And we don't need that. You know, the, we don't need this in the area. City of Colville doesn't need it. And the county definitely does not need this. So please do the right thing and vote this down. Thank, Thank you. you.
Do we have any questions for the opposition before I bring back the applicant with his three minutes of rebuttal? Do we have any questions for the opposition? Anybody? Okay, applicant. Three minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a few issues to, to hit back on. Um, for clarification on a few things that were brought up by the opposition, the, uh, the former plan we do believe did comply with the small area plan. The former that was on here, there was a transition, the small area plan on the property to the north was for three to eight units per acre. A portion of this property was in that three to eight per units per acre, one unit per acre on the western most property and two units per acre. The 400 unit that was presented, that was again denied by everyone who'd come through the city of Cuyville after negotiation and through the uh, with the uh, neighborhood um, did and our the 400 units did comply with the small area plan so I want to clarify that that we did comply uh, and that's why we're back with this because if we couldn't reach an agreement there uh, we're back to this original 543 unit plan as far as fire issues all the houses will be sprinkled uh, that had been discussed uh, previously there was a condition to be in place on the property um, and we had spoken with the uh, county fire department they did not have any issues uh, the last time go around and I don't see what any difference would be this time the uh, utilities um, this is while well, understandably you, you don't have necessary duplicate utilities but you don't have that hardly with any other development that comes through if you're in the city of Cairoville you have city of Cairoville sewer if you're in city of Memphis you have city of Memphis sewer uh, we have a utility that is a uh, regulated by the Mississippi uh, Department of uh, Environment Quality, MDEQ. If anything would fail or happen, the state of Mississippi would take over that. There is Nike, Amazon. Uh, th there are dozens of large uh, users on that system. This is not a Cotton Creek type matter where there's just a private sewer with just a few houses on it. This is basically for the entire portion of Marshall County and dealing with the uh, city of Piperton. So same thing with the water utility district. Um, we, we don't see that being any concern. Those will be perpetual agreements that will have to be agreed to by the county before any building permits would be issued. The county attorney's office would have to sign off on any of those to make sure that the county is fully protected on those matters. Um, as far as some issues were brought up on annexation and some issues of referendums, I believe there was some misspoken and we can get some little better information, but there is specifically an annexation law that requires that a property owner that is agricultural has to agree to it. So the fact, yes, while it is a one vote for, on some referendum issues, it's not as clear cut as you can throw the entire area and there be one vote for this 177 acres. There is a special exception that was written in the law. It's a lot more complicated. Uh, it, it, the law was written, and from my understanding, speaking with legislators, is going to stay that way, where if property owners <coughs> do not want to be, uh, you know, annexed into the territory, they will not. So. Those are the issues that we heard that uh, we wanted to try to come back and address, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions of the board. Thank you. Any board members have any questions of the applicant at this time before I close the public portion of the meeting? I do. Do, do you think it's possible to work with Kyerville, even if you if do you, do you think that even if you lowered the lot density and you and you worked with Kyerville Small Area Plan? Um, that you could get approval through Kyerville? Can I, can I talk? Uh, yeah, Mr. Porter. I'm John Porter, uh, 398 South Shea Road, Kyerville. I'm the applicant. I'd like to try to answer that question. Sure. We, we sat down with the mayor and the board, our attorney, their attorney, and we reached an agreement for 400 lots. I spent almost $100,000 and went through all, jumped through all the hoops that Kyerville planning put on me and everything. I take my plan to the planning commission, I get zero votes. I take my plan to the mayor and, and board, I get zero votes. I've done that, I've been there, I've done that. I can't do it anymore. It was a plan that's totally different than what I'm proposing right now. Uh, I, you know, Right now I build to that niche, I build retirement type housing, all on one level, small lots. That was my first, you know, plan for this area, and it's the best. I want to go back to it. I know it works. Um, as far as fire, you know, and police, I mean, I know fire is not going to be a problem because everything's going to be sprinkled. 
Um, it's going to be a gated neighborhood, private streets. Uh, the county's not going to be responsible for really anything inside other than police and fire and emergency services. And I know that's going to generate about a million eight for the county, which I know the county needs. The county needs this type of development. I mean, it needs tax revenue. It needs needs people, you know, committing to the county and not going to Fayette County or Tipton County or, you know, uh, DeSoto County or wherever, Marshall County. This is we need to keep growth in Shelby County. This is a quality project. This is five hundred and forty three half million dollar houses. And it's going to be an asset to the community. It's going to be an asset to Cairoville, to the county, to the whole area. And uh, and if you look at it, can you put their small area plan back up there for a second? Shows it. Look at the area one in pink. There's, their plan says three to eight units to the acre. Three to eight. I'm three. I'm on the bottom side of that. And they say I'm not compatible. They want me to jump to four acre lots. There is no market for four acre lots. Zero. You'll never see another four acre lot developed in Collierville ever. There's no way. Um, you can buy the land for you know three or four thousand dollars an acre. That might happen. Time you, you you factor in what land prices are out there right now, what development costs are in Collierville. It would you'd have to get seven hundred thousand dollars for the lot. Have to be a three and a half million dollar house. No market for that. None. It took. Those four acre lots that I did Southwoods that they're talking about, in that in that day we bought the land for you know probably four thousand dollars an acre. Those lots sold for like seventy five. It took that was a very slow sellout. That 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 thing took six or seven years to sell out. Very very low demand for that. People are getting away from large lots, acreage, big homes. Uh, they're going towards smaller lots, smaller houses. What I'm building, my houses are about. 2,500 to 3,000 square feet on one level. I'm getting almost $200 a foot. I get more per square foot for my houses than anybody in Collierville right now. And, you know, feeling like I have to apologize for trying to do a development like this. I mean, I don't get it. I mean, Shelby County needs this. It's good for the county. It's good for the area. And, you know, I don't know what else to say. Uh, you know, I don't get it. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions before I close the public portion? Any other questions? Okay, at this time I'm going to close the public portion of our meeting agenda. Dr. Pritchard. I move approval of agenda item number six, PD 19-23CO. Second. I hear a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? I do have a question that... Uh, all the people in support, please stand. All the people, I know the applicants are, all the people in opposition, please stand or raise your hand. Okay, thank you. Is there any further discussion? No further discussion. I assume you're ready to vote. All in favor, say aye. All opposed? No? no? No. Motion fails. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Mm. Dr. Pritchard, before you make the uh, next announcement, I think Mr. Gill wanted to clarify his vote on the consent calendar. Uh, not on the consent. On item number one, I was going to abstain. Okay. I'm abstaining on the item number one. Okay. Number one. Thank gotcha. you. Madam Dr. Chair, Pritchard. Uh, agenda item number eight, SUP 19-38 Oak Haven, 180-foot cell tower on the east side of Sweeney, halfway between Winchester and Shelby Drive. Staff recommends approval with conditions. Okay, uh, since we do have opposition, we're going to go ahead and hear this case. Luke Hatcherman here representing Tower Ventures, 495 Tennessee Street, Suite 152, Memphis, Space. Okay, thank you. We're going to go ahead and hear the case first. Go ahead. Clerkship Diggs, Office of Planning and Development. The item before you is SUP 19-38. Uh, so the loc it, uh, the site is located at the southeast corner of the intersection of Runway Road and Sweeney Road. 
Uh, the applicant is Tower Ventures, uh, represented by Lou Katzerman. The total area of the site is 25.73 acres with a leased area of approximately 4,500 square feet. Uh, the current zoning is the Residential Urban uh, 2 District, RU2, and the request is for a 180-foot cell tower. Uh, so the the site is located in the Oak Haven neighborhood. Um, you see the vicinity map on the right side of the screen. Um, Staff originally received one letter of opposition at the time that the staff report was completed. However, this letter was, uh, the opposition was withdrawn. Um, I'll discuss this in detail in a little while. Um, and also we received one additional letter late last night in opposition. Um, and I believe that the opposition's representative is here today to discuss the concerns raised in this letter. Uh, so here we have the zoning map, uh, the site, is uh, surrounded by predominantly single-family residential, uh, the R8 district. Um, there are several planned developments to the south um, and to the west. Um, and in addition, the Memphis International Airport is located to the west. Uh, surrounding land uses, again, are uh, predominantly uh, single-family, oops, sorry, single-family residential um, to the east and north. Uh, to the south, we also have industrial uses and vacant land to the west. And now you'll see the site plan and landscaping on the screen. Um, the site plan shows um, the lot leased area on the north portion of the screen, and it will have a single access drive from Sweeney Road uh, leading to the lot leased area, and uh, the leased area itself is proposed to be surrounded by a six-foot site-proof fence uh, surrounded by uh, Nellie R. Stevens Hollies and an additional uh, landscaping uh, screen on the western side of the site between Sweeney Road and the lot lease area. Uh, this shows the elevations uh, proposed for this tower. The tower itself is on the right-hand side of the screen, um, and it is a 180-foot monopole cell tower with four antennas shown on the elevation. On the left-hand side of the screen, you'll see the uh, uh, elevations of the proposed uh, fencing. Here are a few site photos. Um, the, the photo on the left-hand side of the screen shows a view of the site uh, facing southeast on Sweeney Road, and the photo on the right-hand side shows a view facing south on Sweeney Road. Um, so on the right-hand photo, on the, in the right portion of the image, you will see the area that is owned by the airport authority, and the site itself is a predominantly <coughs> wooded area. It is undeveloped at this time. <coughs> Uh, one additional site photo is a view from Walpole Avenue on the eastern portion of the site looking southwest. This is just to illustrate that from the viewpoint of the single family residential on the eastern side of this site, um, the uh, view of the site is currently just the wooded area. Uh, so the Memphis 3.0 general plan does not address cell towers. Cell towers are regulated by the Telecommunications Act of 1996. Uh, so these are the special use permit approval criteria. Staff agrees that the approval criteria regarding special use permits as sent out in the UDC section 9.6.9 are met. I want to draw your attention to 9.6.9H at the bottom portion of the screen, which just states that any decision to deny a special use permit request to place, construct, or modify personal wireless service facilities shall be in writing and supported by substantial evidence contained in a written, written record, and the review body may not take into account any environmental or health concerns. Uh, there are additional approval criteria for cell towers, and staff agrees that the requirements, these additional requirements, requirements as set out in UDC paragraph 2.6.2 I2 are met. Um, so, as far as the um, co-location requirements um, for this section, um, the proposed cell tower is a 180-foot monopole uh, cell tower and will accommodate six tenant arrays. Um, four tenant arrays are currently shown on the site plan, and I believe that there are only three carriers in the Memphis market due to the merger of Sprint with T-Mobile and Ceasefire pulling out of the market completely. Uh, moving on to the screening and fencing requirements, um, <coughs> 
For cell towers, uh, the proposed compound will be enclosed by the six foot site proof wooden fence. Um, the landscape buffer was described earlier, um, and we believe that the combination of the uh, the Nelly R. Stevens Hollies and the additional proposed uh, landscape plate on the western side will satisfy the requirements of a class three buffer, which is required. Uh, so the, the letter of opposition that was received by staff at the time of completion of the staff report was submitted by the Memphis Airport Authority, who expressed their concerns regarding the applicant's failure to submit um, proof that they had filed with the Federal Aviation Administration for um, approval of the height of the tower itself. Um, the proposed height is 180 feet. Um, so after further discussion with both staff and the applicant, the authority agreed to withdraw their objection to the request contingent upon the approval of the proposal um, as stated in the FAA's um, response to the required form. Um, you can see this correspondence beginning on page 28 of the staff report. Um, so in conclusion, the applicant is seeking special use approval for a 180-foot cell tower in the residential urban two district. Uh, staff agrees that both the approval criteria as set out in section 9.6.9 .9 and the special use review requirements for cell towers as set out in paragraph 2.6.2 I2 of the Unified Development Code are met. Due to the site's proximity to the Memphis International Airport, the approval of the special use permit is contingent upon the approval of the proposed tower by the Federal Aviation Administration as indicated in an official obstruction evaluation slash airport airspace analysis determination. Um, and the applicant will be required to submit a study from a professional engineer um, prior to receiving a permit from the Office of Code Construction um, Enforcement. Um, and this project will not have a substantial or undue adverse effect upon adjacent <clears throat> property, the character of the neighborhood, traffic conditions, parking, utility facilities, and other matters affecting the public health, safety, and general welfare. Uh, so staff recommendation is approval with conditions. Uh, the conditions can be seen on page 16 of the staff report. Um, I do want to point out that the first condition um, addresses the airport authority's concern with regard to the final height of the proposed tower. So this condition states that the final height of the tower shall comply with the approved height indicated in the submitted FAA determination. And I believe the applicant's representative will be able to speak to the current status of the filing of this form uh, with the FAA. And that concludes my staff report. Thank you. Applicant? Yes, sir. Yes. May I ask a question of staff? Yes. Before we go to the applicant, can you go back to the street scene? Sure. Please. My, my question is that those trees that are there, will those stay that are on Swinney Road? The majority of them will, except for the ones <coughs> right up on the street, but we will put that uh, landscaping buffer. So, so these, because I'm assuming it looks like you have an access road that will take you behind that, right? Right. Those keep can't them, stay? But we'll keep them to the extent that we can. Okay. All right. Okay. Applicant, we're ready for your presentation. All right. At this time, we defer to our opposition, please. Okay. We're ready for the opposition statement. Madam Chairman, uh, members of the board, uh, good morning and thank you for allowing us to be here. I'm Lou Wardlaw. Uh, I'm a lawyer at 6410 Poplar Avenue, Suite 1000, Memphis, Tennessee, 38119. I represent SBA Communications Corporation doing business as TV6 Holdings, LLC. As was pointed out earlier, they are another cell tower carrier. Uh, my client has an interest in a nearby cellular tower located at 3830 Chillahoma in Memphis. It's just down the way. Uh, in fact, Tower Ventures, the good folks sitting behind me, uh, were the developer of this very tower before selling it, uh, ultimately placing it under the control of my client. They built my client's tower. They're now asking for another tower in the shadow of it. Uh, we opposed the SUP application because Tower Ventures has not nearly met its burden of proof uh, that's required by the Unified Development Contract. Uh, if I had some discussions with several of you and had some discussions with others, and one of the concerns is, well, why should this board uh, protect 
one competitor from another. That's not it. If I wanted to build retail down the street and you had retail there, that's not my business. If it's a good idea, it's a good idea. Well, the UDC doesn't control retail and retail in proximity. The UDC does control through, first off, the special use permitting process and then the, the, the cell tower process. It does control what you have to have specifically and differently to have a CMS or cell tower. I passed up a copy to Mr. Whitehead uh, of my letter that was submitted yesterday uh, that fully details line by line in the UDC why this cannot be approved by this body and could, cannot ultimately stand uh, if it were. I've also submitted some other documents and asked that those be made for uh, part of the record for all reasons uh, and all purposes. The, the highlights of what I've said in my letter and the most critical points are, are as follows. The UDC sets out the mandatory requirements for a special use permit for a CMS tower. And it's, it's it, they're mandatory. They're non-negotiables. They're written. Uh, the city council, the county commission, this body with input uh, wrote these rules. And, and they're the rules. And, and they're mandatory. If the requirements are not met, all of them, each and every one of them, the SUP cannot be legally granted as a matter of law. Uh, critically, and I'm going to read this directly in quotes, any application for a new tower, such as this one, shall not be approved, nor shall any building permit for a new tower be issued, unless the applicant certifies that the equipment planned for the proposed tower cannot be accommodated on any existing or approved tower. Well, that hasn't been done. And it hasn't been done because it cannot be done. There's cursory language saying, yes, we can, uh, we can do things that no one else can do. It doesn't meet the clear requirement, the mandatory requirement of the UDC. And it doesn't meet it because it can't meet it. It can't ever meet it. Uh, we've submitted in our materials, again, that I gave to Director Whitehead, uh, a declaration of Sean Welter. She's the uh, site marketing manager for SBA Communications. And among other relevant statements, uh, Sean swears under pe penalty of perjury the following. Uh, the tower on Chulahoma Road has capacity to co-locate additional carriers. You've just heard uh, there are very few left uh, in this area because of the various murders and ceasefire having abandoned the area completely. Uh, the existing tower built by them, now operated by my clients, uh, can co-locate additional carriers already. Uh, second, SBA has not received any inquiries for co-location which its tower could not properly and adequately serve. Uh, SBA, this is also in the affidavit or in the declaration, is ready, willing, and able to co-locate additional carrier equipment on the existing tower. Uh, so they can't make the certification that this tower serves a need that's not already being met. It's redundant, and its redundancy causes it to be in violation of the UDC. Now. They were the applicants and the developers of the tower that my clients have control of now. So none of this will be any surprise to Tower Ventures. Um, when Tower Ventures applied for that tower on Chulahoma several years ago, they stated specifically in their application, and it was found in the findings, it was repeated in the staff report, it was included in the zoning. There is a need for improved cellular coverage in this area of Memphis. And this site is necessary because there is inadequate signal strength in the Oak Haven area. Now, don't get confused. That's not for the tower they're asking for today. That's for the tower they asked for and received many, many years ago. If you look at the front of your staff report, if you look at the front of the application, this tower is to serve the Oak Haven area. So what they're asking to do is to put up a second tower right in the shadow of the first tower that they already had approved and then sold to my client. Now, that may sound like two competitors grousing about competition, but what it is is a direct violation of the UDC. They cannot meet the requirements of the UDC. They're mandatory without which not, and this body cannot approve unless they are met. Uh, we've submitted those zoning documents, the application, the original staff report as well. That's all within the record. Uh, now, having gotten that first tower approved and with it readily available, uh, for additional uh, towers, additional carriers, uh, Tower Ventures seeks to place this redundant tower right in the shadow of the original one. It's not needed. Uh, it is, the, the term came up earlier, it is, 
it is predatory. They're trying to put another tower right next to the first tower where one is not needed. We submitted, uh, don't take my word for it, uh, a detailed analysis, an RF propagation map, engineering analyses that conclusively show that there is not the need based on the frequency, based on the cell towers, based on the numbers to have this there. On this basis alone, it cannot meet the SUP requirements under the UDC. It can't ever meet them as long as my client's tower remains there. They can't certify that, uh, and it must be denied. Now, I try to be reasonable. I've come before this board a lot. I think I probably come before this board as many as I've been here the past. I don't remember the last time I haven't been before this board. Uh, and I try to be reasonable. If they think they can meet that, if they think they can certify that, I think they need that chance to do it. Right now, I think they're, they're critically and woefully lagging. Move this off 30, 60, 90 days. Allow them the opportunity to do that. Allow them the opportunity to try to, to, to meet the requirement and clean up the mess. I don't believe they can do it because there's vacancies on our tower, my client's towers, right now. But I ask that this body today here vote to deny the SUP because it does not meet the requirements of the Unified Development Code. Alternatively, that this body hold this matter uh, for between 30 and 90 days in order that the applicant be provided the chance uh, to do it. I don't want it to be said that we're not fair and we're doing anything by ambush. Uh, I'm available for, for any questions. Uh, my letter is in the record. Uh, the whole, uh, the virtually the entire approval process for the uh, the original tower, which was developed by them, is also in the record. The RF propagation maps, the engineering maps about the cellular needs, all in the record. Uh, thank you again very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions for? Yeah. Yes. Where is this Butler? tower you you're mentioning? Uh, Staff may be able to help it. me with it's, the address. Is it at Tullahoma and Chevy Drive? Tullahoma and Christine Road, right behind the church uh, at. 3830 Tullahoma. It's so 3830 Tullahoma, down. right. So it's at the back of the New Mount Olive Church of God in Christ. Okay. It's on the back corner. I know what you're talking about. Right. And as far as towers go, that's neck and neck. Any other questions? Yes. Um, how many vacancies does that tower have? Two or more is what I've got. I ratcheted back on the declaration when dealing with my client because I don't like the or more. I don't want to promise anything that we can't have. Two vacancies at a minimum. And the new tower is requesting four. Five. Five. Is what my recollection was from the staff's presentation. Four. Yeah. Four. If, if I'm incorrect, I'm incorrect. Uh, the, the, and and the, the, there's addition to the vacant locations on the tower, there already are several carriers on there. <clears throat> Simply put, we've got more tower space than we've got carriers in the location, and now they're falling all on top of each other. Okay. Thank you, uh, applicant. Are you ready to make your presentation? Thank you. Yes. Thank you. With all due respect to Mr. Wardlaw, he has a glaring lack of knowledge about the tower business. The report that he turned in is full of holes. Most of the facts are not exactly true. A lot of them are not even true. SBA is a $27 billion corporation headquartered in Boca Raton, Florida. They have an entire division who does nothing but come to boards like this and intimidate these boards, failed threats of lawsuits, telling you that OPD doesn't do their job right, that all their conclusions are wrong, and that they're right. They get a computer program to come up with all this junk that is in this rebuttal, and it's absolutely wrong. First of all, we built that tower in 2008, 2009. This board approved it. T-Mobile is the only tenant on that tower. Over the years, T-Mobile has added equipment to the tower. Now, did Mr. Wardlaw present a structural analysis signed by an engineer stating that the tower had capacity? Just so the record 
There are plenty of towers in America that I've dealt with in my 25 year career that had one tenant on the top that had zero capacity left. I know this Sean Welter. She's a very great, good salesperson. She's not an engineer. She's certifying secondhand information is correct. She's are swearing to it. She's not certified. This, this would be like me certifying that every Tower Ventures tower has plenty of capacity on it without getting a, a structural analysis complete. Uh, she's basing this on the fact that there's one carrier on the tower. Now, if I'm a site acquisition agent and I call SBA and I say, I want to go on this tower, they're going to ask me for two things, an application to know what equipment's going on a tower and a fee for a structural analysis. If you think for one second Verizon would go on this tower on Sean Welter's word, you're completely wrong. They're going to get a scientific analysis of this tower. Okay. Now, just for a point of clarification, Mr. Wardlaw will tell you that our tower, proposed tower, is in the shadow of his. Through scientific analysis, we are almost one mile away from his tower, 0.89 miles. SBA knows better than that. SBA knows that a tower one mile away cannot serve another mile. He's completely devoid of any facts about the topography, the tree cover, and most importantly, the density of the neighborhood. You cannot, one tower does not have the capacity to serve the amount of people in that neighborhood. In addition, we had a neighborhood meeting where eight or nine people showed up, and the biggest complaint, coverage in that neighborhood to the east. I asked them, are you on T-Mobile knowing that T-Mobile is on that tower? Yes. Well, it may not be scientific, but the public's opinion matters. Now, let's delve into this RF study. Do you see a signature here or even a name of an RF engineer that did this study? Well, I have a son that's a computer genius, so I called him last night showed this to him. Where do you think these maps came from? He did a little searching on the internet. He found a program. They, they have a software program where they found this and they put it up here as the gospel. Well, let's go into the Telecom Act of 1996. It says that substantial evidence is required for denial of an application. This doesn't meet the standard. And I'd hope that the city would never turn somebody down on something like this. It would be a complete violation. Now, let's go to some of the maps that I submitted to you yesterday. Yes, that one. Go through the history of this area. Okay. Sorry. This shows all the towers are in the immediate vicinity of this. The SBA program that they put up there did not show most of these towers. Now, the uh, red marker is where the proposed tower is, okay? You start to see other towers there. You see the SBA site. To the northeast of the SBA site is a new tower that we built in, uh, last year. It's 0.66 miles from the SBA site. Verizon is the only tenant on the tower. Now you have to ask yourself, if you're Verizon and you need speed to market on a new site, why would you ask Tower Ventures to build you a site when there's another site right there, 0.66 miles away? Real simple. The SBA site does, did not work to fill the coverage gap that Verizon has. Now, if the SBA site was built in 2008, let's look at the surrounding sites. The BHO site, this is a mile and a half south, also on Tullahoma, okay? That was built in 2015-16. Their American Tower site, uh, 1.9 miles away, that was built in 2010. And then of course, the, you've got the Tower Venture site uh, to the north that was built in 2019. Why do you think all those towers were built in that neighborhood? Real simple. 
the SBA tower cannot serve that neighborhood, given the, the density, automobile traffic, everything that goes on in that neighborhood, there, there's a need for more capacity. Mr. Wardlaw wants to tell you that the tower's redundant. Well, let's look at the bottom left-hand corner of this graphic, away from our, you've got four towers in the general vicinity of each other. Why is that? Well, they're closer, obviously closer than what we're proposing. They got, all got approved. Reason being, capacity has nothing to do with, oh, I, you know, there's a lot of places you can go to. Oh, my phone works fine here. Try to download something. Doesn't work. That's a direct result of lack of capacity. Bottom line, that tower will, will serve the western part of that neighborhood. It will provide capacity to the neighborhood. It will serve the airport. And as we all know, the airport's in the middle of an expansion. UPS is expanding over there. There's definitely a need for that tower even though SBA, our competitor, disagrees. Let's talk a little bit about SBA again. Did some checking last night on the internet. Came up with a lot of things and I wanted to bring to this board's attention. I'm sorry I don't have a great printer at home. Here's a, where they sued another competitor, Tillman Infrastructure. Here's where they took you know, Hampshire Town to court. Here's another um, New Hampshire town they took to court. SBA has actually gone to the extent of siding with the opposition to oppose the tower, getting the tower blocked, going back to build a tower. Then when the city denies them, they sue the city over. This is intimidation. This is corporate bullying. And I hope that this board does not uh, stand for this. We're a local company. We're mom and pop. We're beginning our fourth decade in business. We're community people. We have a great reputation. We've got a lot invested in this community, tons. And we've done everything for this board and this community that we've ever said we were going to do. I can't say the same for other tower companies. In conclusion, we received a positive recommendation from staff, just like every other application we've turned in. Uh, the conditions that he cites, uh, Mr. Wardlaw cites that are uh, lacking our application, their conditions, this structural analysis piece that he talks about, cannot, you cannot get a building permit without one. The structural analysis is studied by a gentleman, Kenneth Ayers, who represents the city well. He's an engineer. It takes an engineer to delve into those uh, structural analysis. It's probably a waste of time, no offense to OPD, to uh, submit it to OPD when it's going to be reviewed by somebody else at a later <coughs> date. No tower can be built without FAA approval. That's, that's condition number one, conclusion number one in the staff report. And uh, we, we agree with it. Uh, we have no issues with anything that's happened. This, uh, if uh, SBA wasn't trying to bully us, we would have gotten a, this has been unanimous approval here today. We'd have been a consent agenda item. This thing is with, completely without merit, and it's just a big waste of everybody's time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I ask that you respectfully approve our uh, request, and I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. Do you. we have any questions before I close the public portion? I have uh, a question for the applicant, and then I'd love to hear um, Mr. Wardlaw's response to anything that Lou, I'd, li I'd like to just hear if he has any response, because I think Lou, because Mr. Katzerman provided a lot more data on a broader scale for us. I just want to see what uh, Mr. Wardlaw says, but just one question for the applicant. Do, do you, how does this proliferation of towers does seem to be important for 5G service. Do you think, do these towers, will they be used for 5G down, or are these all 4G tech and then will these towers be converted to 5g down the road what what's the plan for that yes um 
AT&T and uh, T-Mobile. Uh, T-Mobile's actually got a couple of 5G towers in the Memphis area, according to the nationwide 5G map. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, these towers will eventually be converted to 5G. What is pushing the need for these towers is the uh, data. There's not enough data capacity. And when 5G rolls around, that need will increase. You made a very good argument. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Billy Orgel, um 6415 Ronald Road. Do we still do that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hadn't been down here in a while. But uh, thank you all very much uh, for indulging us. So, uh, Ms. Gill, you asked great questions, and you're familiar with towers uh, from in the past. The uh, What you're seeing in the city right now, and you're asking about 5G, which is just the next generation. It's an evolution of what's going on. And some of your phones, I don't know what service you guys have but may say 5G on it, or if you travel, it may say it at the top. But I don't know if you've noticed, that this is all part and parcel. It's not just towers anymore. Uh, there's other means of delivering services. So what you're seeing in the city, and I don't know if, I, I, I think it's been handled at the federal level and the state level, and then I, I think our mayor's done a good job navigating the process. But now you're seeing throughout the dense parts of the city, even though you have towers, even though you have rooftop installations, you're seeing installations go on utility poles and light poles. And uh, I could drive you around. We spot it just like in y'all's businesses, y'all spot certain things. But you go up and down Poplar, you come into neighborhoods. I've, I've seen some on Main Street and you're seeing new poles go up and new installations going up. That doesn't get rid of the, the cell towers. It's just density because 60, 70, 80 percent of the people now don't have uh, home phones. I'm still one of the idiots that has it, but I think Comcast gives me two lines or something when I when I've got my Comcast service. But so you're going to see more and more delivery services. This is just one of them. So you you take on the site that we sold to SBA, we sold uh, several hundred towers to them in 2015, so five years ago. And uh, that site we built that's uh, almost a mile away for T-Mobile. Well, T-Mobile is on three or four of their sites surrounding the area. And they're gonna start with their same program of doing what we call small cells. And, and I'm sure they're working with the city as Verizon and AT&T already have, and they're putting small cells everywhere. So it's, it's just a huge web of network like where we all live, either we have underground utilities, we have above ground utilities. You need all that to get the electricity to your house. And we all get frustrated when you're sitting there with your phone trying to do it. So we're not, we're not poaching a customer, and I actually called somebody, I think Lou was hired yesterday, but uh, by SBA, but I called my contact at SBA who buys stuff from me, and Larry Harris, he's in Boca Raton, been there 20 years, good guy. And, I, and he went through, you know, they have a, what Mr. Katzman told us, they have a program doing this, and he said, well, AT&T wanted to get on our tower one time after you had sold it to us, and they didn't. I said, well, okay, well, it didn't work in their network. Everybody's got a different network and has different needs and they all use different frequencies and so they propagate or they lay out a lot differently it's it's not one site over the other the bho site has verizon on it the sba site has t-mobile on it the other site that we own up at the top of the page has verizon on it so verizon's a mile and a half apart on that there there's some airport towers they're all on them American Tower uh, has T-Mobile again, redundant, uh, right below our tower, like 0.6 miles away, I think. But And then there's on the other side of the airport uh, where Rains comes in. There's a tower there. There's a building that's got AT&T on it north of the airport. There's a car wash south of the airport at Shelby Drive and uh, what's that street, uh, the Airways, mm -hmm. that has two or three tenants. I mean, it's because there's a proliferation of uses. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and that's why you need it. It's not, we're taking one off. Now, one last thing. Nationally, there is a program by AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile to go right across the street where there's no zoning and build towers. That's in the shadow of a tower. And it's happening all over the country, particularly in no zoning environments. We're not in the zoning environment. We have an able staff led by Josh and a lot of wonderful people that that look over all this and and take care of this isn't building next door to somebody this is building almost a mile away to accommodate additional usages and there's new entrance into the market so anyway i hope i didn't answer your question thank you long. mr Orwell. Sorry. thank you <laughs> mr Wardlaw, you uh, want to answer okay 
Do you do you think, Mr. Wardlow, that the, when when you see the broader map of all of the towers that would that are within similar or less distance to the proposed tower, how, how do you and any other remarks that you have? Well, I'll start out with saying I'm a big boy and don't usually have to clear my name. Some of you may know I'm less of a big boy now than I was a couple years ago. Uh, but I'm not a bully. I'm not a liar. And I don't waste people's time. And I don't appreciate anybody saying that. Mr. Orville I've known for many years. He and I are having a disagreement today. I don't think in 100 years he would call me a bully, a liar, or a waste of time. So, with that, what Mr. Ketterman forgets is this is not my burden of proof. It is his burden of proof. He is representing the applicant. The UDC requires, does not require me to stand up and disprove. It does not require me, Mr. Gill, to have an engineer or an RF expert to come and talk about each of the other towers. What it requires the applicant to do through their representative, any applicant for a new tower shall not be approved, nor shall any building permit for a new tower be issued unless the applicant certifies that the equipment plan for the proposed tower cannot be accommodated on any existing or approved tower. They have not done that. They cannot do that. It is illegal. The SUP does not meet the requirements. That is not me bullying. That is not me threatening. That is not a lawsuit in New England at some ungiven time. That is me telling you, reading out, what the Unified Development Code says. My clients don't get to rule, write the rules. Frankly, Mr. Orgel doesn't get to write the rules. This body, the city council, the county commission, get to write the rules. The people that come before these bodies, all we have is the rules. And that's what the rule says. I appreciate it, and I can answer any question. Thank you, Mr. Warlock. OPD. May I ask say something? Well, hold on one second, Mr. Kassman. Is OPD, what's OPD's position on the UDC? It appears, quite frankly, that the local zoning code conflicts with federal law, quite frankly. Uh -huh. So, in such a, the Telecommunications Act is a, is a statute of preemptive nature. Uh -huh. However, it's not fully preemptive. When Congress passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996, they didn't say uh, municipalities have no zoning control over this subject matter, which they have done in certain other matters. They said, you still can review cell towers through your zoning processes. However, any rejection, any denial has to be done in writing, and it has to be based upon substantial evidence. So I think both the applicant and Mr. Wardlaw are right. The UDC puts the burden on the applicant, and the federal law puts the burden on Mr. Wardlaw. And uh, when local law conflicts with federal law, I think we all at, in this room know. Local law wins. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, but let's get to the substance of what the, the issue here is. Prior to approval, I think what we have done in the conditions is prior to approval, prior to construction, prior to erection, these matters will be addressed. Uh, are they being submitted to you before you for your review right now? No, and I think that is what the code says. It says prior, the special use permit application shall contain the following. And uh, I just got this this morning. I got an email. I haven't fully reviewed Mr. Wardlaw's presentations uh, and materials, so I'm going a little off uh, the cuff here. But he may have a point in certain respects. But then within the conditions, that would be ta taken care of. That would be reviewed prior to the construction of this. So even if we, even approve, if we approve this. It, right. <coughs> right. So the intent, if the, if the letter of the UDC is not being met, certainly the intent would be. Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions before I close the public portion? Yeah. Okay. We have a question. Let me ask a question of the applicant. Did Crown site 
two, that, that existing tower, how tall is it? Uh, at the uh, airport, it's uh, 100 feet. 100? Yes. And then the proposal is 180? 180. Okay. All right. Okay. I had a couple of comments, please. Anybody? You want to add a couple of comments? No, I don't need any more comments. I'm, I'm Thank you. Right. From you? Are we through? Yeah. All right, I'm going to close the public portion of this meeting. And uh, can I get a motion? Move approval of agenda item number eight, case number SUP 19-38 City. Second. We have an approval. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion? Chair, yeah, just a comment. I just look at item two here on the conclusions we lean on staff to make recommendations in this case i think it would be on consent had mr wardlaw not been here i do appreciate you coming and bringing these up the fact that it just came last night we haven't even seen it uh I, sometimes i feel like judge and jury up here i feel like i'm in more of a courtroom than a land use uh, venue but at any rate i'm i'm going to support the case I, I think the staff i agree with the staff's recommendation I'll let the legal stuff work itself out. But in terms of land use, which is what we're supposed to do, I support the application. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I assume we're ready to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. And that concludes our land use control board meeting for today are we going to have pictures or yes madam chair mr norcross thinks he came here just to deliver a book to me okay but we are also going to take a photograph okay. of all ten of us all right <laughs>